Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, a very good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone, and welcome to the launch event of the FAO in Geneva Social Protection Dialogue Series, jointly organized with the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division in partnership with the International Labour Organization and UNICEF. My name is Dominique Bourgeon, and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and I will be moderating today's session. Before starting our event, allow me to share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual discussion. This webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will later be available on our website, along with the various related resources relevant to this session. It is scheduled to last for about one hour and 45 minutes. We have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for Q&A session, so please submit your questions in the Q&A module, not in the regular chat box, and we'll try our best to answer most of them, either in writing or orally during the webinar. If you have any problem or technical issue, please send a message in the chat box to ask for our support team to help you. So that's all for the housekeeping uh, issues today, and I would now like to take a moment to briefly introduce our speakers uh, today. We are very honored uh, and pleased to have with us today a number of distinguished speakers who will intervene on the topic of pathways for extending universal coverage of social protection. We will hear from His Excellency Ambassador Federico uh, Villegas, permanent representative of Argentina to the UN in Geneva and president of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Ambassador Villegas has kindly agreed to record the video message as he is unable to be with us live as, the, as, as you know, the Council is currently in session. We have also His Excellency Ambassador Max, Mark Textein de Beutzwerve, permanent representative of Belgium to the UN in Geneva. His Excellency Omar uh, Znieber, permanent representative of Morocco to the UN in Geneva. Uh, Ambassador Znieber will speak in French, but uh, an English translation will appear in the chat box as he speaks and will, made, and will be made available to all participants after the event. We have also Mr. Maximo Torero, FAO Chief Economist, Ms. Uh, Natalia Window Rossi, Director of Social Policy and Social Protection at UNICEF, Ms. Rima El Aja, Head of Economic and Marketing Services in the Ministry of Agriculture of Lebanon. Mr. Steve Chiwele, Assistant Director of Social Welfare in the Ministry of Community Development and Social Welfare of Zambia. Ms. Christina Berendt, Head of the Social Policy Unit at ILO. And Mr. Stephen Devereux, Research Fellow at the Institute of Development Studies. Thank you very much all for agreeing to be with us uh, today. Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, delegates and participants, dear colleagues, as this webinar is the first in, in the series, we have asked uh, our FAO Chief Economist, Mr. Maximo Torero, to introduce uh, the team of our dialogue and the objective of the series. Uh, Mr. Torero had to record this video uh, as, he's, uh, as he had a conflicting engagement in the margin of the UN General Assembly. So we know uh, play his presentation uh, that will, as I said, set the scene for our discussion. So if we can play Maximo video, please. Dear colleagues, my name is Maximo Torero, and I am the chief economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. It is a pleasure for me to present today and to launch the Social Protection Dialogue series that will be in, happening in FAO in offices in Geneva. Why social protection is so important and why we need to look at this. A way to reflect uh, the challenges that we are facing is to look at what is happening in terms of chronic undernourishment. In this graph, we are showing the prevalence and the number of hungry people in the world over time. The axis on the left and the, and, and the orange line show the prevalence of undernourishment, whereas the axis on the right and the gray line show the number of undernourished people in millions. As you can see, there has been, in the last five years, a significant increase in undernourishment. After re remaining relatively unchanged since 2015, the prevalence of undernourishment, what we call the POU, jumped from 8.0 to 9.3 percent percentage points from 2019 to 2020 and rose at a slower pace in 2021 
to 9.8%. The estimated have been presented as ranges for the last two years to reflect the added uncertainties around the numbers induced by the COVID-19 pandemic, which makes sometimes very difficult to collect the data that was necessary. An estimated 702 to 828 million people were facing hunger in 2021, an increase of 150 million people compared to 2019, which really reflects the significant impact that COVID-19 pandemic had over hunger. The further rise in hunger in 2021 after the sharp increase from 2019 to 2020 reflects the exacerbated inequalities across and within countries due to an equal pattern of economic recovery among the countries, and also due to the significant increase of the, of the, of the inequalities, which end affecting the most vulnerable populations. If we look at the major drivers, we found that conflict is the first one, followed by slowdowns and downturns, where COVID-19 play an impact, and then we have climate change and variability, which will also be affected. But there has happened in shocks like the latest one, the war in Ukraine, which has exacerbated this situation and has shown also how vulnerable this sector is and how much poverty is increasing. The GDP contraction, not only because of the lockdowns, but also what we are observing today, we have seen a spike of 97 million more people in poverty in 2020, a historically unprecedented increase in global poverty, with about 60% of the new poor in South Asia and another quarter in Sub Saharan Africa. So colleagues, the world is faced with huge challenges and ability to achieve the SDG tools. About 80% of extreme poor and 75% of the moderate poor live in rural areas. Up to 4.5 billion people globally depend on food systems, at least in part of their household livelihoods, including employment in food value chains, the self-employment and family labor, and those in informal migrant and seasonal wage labor. Over half of these are small-scale agricultural producers and their families. Agri-food systems transformations can therefore be a primary driver of economic recovery and poverty reduction for the majority of the world's poor people. But this is not automatic. The rural poor face disadvantages and barriers which limit their ability to participate in food systems transformations they generally have low levels of agricultural productivity, high exposure to risks to production, households income and consumption, with few formal coping mechanisms, and low levels of access to information, services and products, assets, and face pervasive multiple market failures. Women in agriculture and more broadly within food systems face specific constraints in their access to productive resources and services and have limited agency, which hinders their decision-making power. This means that we need policy measures that are purposely designed and implemented to enable the poor and hungry in rural areas to benefit and actively take part in and contribute to processes of food system transformation. Otherwise, it is quite possible that processes of food system transformation could end up creating further poverty, hunger, and especially exacerbating inequalities. So colleagues, the situation today has increased poverty. The situation today as an outcome, has increased significant inequality. But again, we also need to be careful that an agri-food system transformation could create winners and losers. And there also, we need to support the most vulnerable that could be affected. Now, the overall performance of food systems or the agri-food systems depends on their coherence and interaction with several other systems, including agri-food systems, environmental health, and social protection systems. Within this array of interconnected and overlapping systems, social protection can play an essential role in making food systems more inclusive and thereby enabling food systems to contribute to eradicating poverty, hunger, and inequality. More specifically, evidence shows that social protection directly and indirectly strengthens people's access to nutritious food. For instance, school feeding programs provide direct access to food. Cash transfers provide households with additional income that makes food more affordable. In the long run, improved access to food leads to better improved health and increased human capital, which makes people more productive and able to earn higher incomes available through employment in the food system. 
When predictable and well-targeted social protection programs can support households to engage in new economic activities and to capitalize on opportunities created by the continued economic dynamism of food systems, they will be bringing about together term, long-term improvements in access to healthy diets, in addition to stimulating the development of local economies. Colleagues, social protection enables households to adopt their livelihoods to the changing climate and to better manage natural resources. This is critically considering the threats that climate change and the depletion of natural resources pose on the sustainability of food systems and to people's livelihoods, in particular to the rural livelihoods that largely depend on the nature of natural resources base and that they are highly exposed to changes in climate. Last but not least, Social protection mitigates the impacts of shocks, including those associated with weather extremes, such as droughts, example, what we are observing right now in the Horn of Africa, and, and floods like the one we are observing recently in Pakistan. And also to pandemic like COVID-19 and price shocks, like the one we have been seeing over the last two years or more, where social protection has allowed to cope significantly and therefore reduce significantly the reduction of the GDP of the number of poor people that were affected as a result of COVID-19. We are seeing increased recognition of the role of social protection in achieving more inclusive agri-food system transformations. More than half of national food system pathways refer to using social protection as a policy measure to make national agri-food systems more inclusive. Partly as a consequence of the role that social protection play in mitigating the impacts of COVID-19, there is increasing appreciation of the need of universal coverage of social protection and the need for sustainable social protection systems and the indispensability of such systems as a cornerstone for all socially just, healthy, and well-functioning social protection programs. It is is evident of the importance of social protection. In spite of this, the world is far off of meeting the SDG target 1.3, which calls on con countries to implement national appropriate social protection systems and measures for all, including floors, and by 2030, achieving substantial coverage of the poor and the most vulnerable. According to the latest ILO SP report, less than half of the world population and a mere 17% in the case of Africa, is covered by at least one social protection benefit, meaning that the majority of people in the world are unprotected against any risk. The World Bank data confirmed that even among the poorest coverage of social protection is this small, this mildly low in certain parts of the world. Only 18% of the bottom of the quantile of the distribution receive social protection assistance in low-income countries compared to 43% in low-middle-income countries and 76% in high-income countries. The disparities are even starker for contri con contributory social insurance schemes, as a mere 2% of the poorest quantity are covered by social insurance in low-income countries. And globally, less than 30% of people considered vulnerable, this means children, elderly, and working-age people, not covered by social insurance, receive a non-contributory social assistance, including only 7% in Sub-Saharan Africa. In addition to the large coverage gaps, the levels of provision in rural areas, where the most of the world pools are concentrated, is inadequate. The graph in this slide shows the average per capita transfer delivered to the beneficiaries of social protection programs in rural and urban areas across country groups. The vertical axis indicates the value of transferring dollars and the horizontal axis indicates the country income grouping. The blue bars are for urban areas and the brown bars are for the rural areas. In this graph, we see that in low income and low middle income countries, per capita transfer values are considerably lower compared to upper middle income and high income countries. In low income countries and low middle income countries, per capita transfer values are considerably below the poverty line. Across all countries' income groups, per capita transfer values in rural areas are lower than in urban areas. The value of transfers in rural areas is so low that it undermines the ability of these programs to reduce poverty in rural areas. We need a specific focus on ensuring that coverage of social protection in rural areas is added. So we need a significant improvement in the access to social protection programs in rural areas. 
to help fulfill the potential of social protection in eradication, hunger, and poverty through agri-food systems, we need to massively expand the coverage of social protection. This is why FAO is an active member of the Universal Social Protection 2030 Alliance, also known as the USP 2030, which for the first time brings together governments, international regional organizations, social partners, and civil society organizations in a shared commitment towards ensuring social protection for all. Together with these partners, FAO focuses on supporting national social protection systems in expanding coverage to rural areas and on ensuring that these systems recognize the commonalities and the specificities of different population groups in rural areas. For example, fisheries and pastoralists. These specificities include high levels of informality and precarious employment, largely depend on natural resource base, exposure to climate shocks and more gradual changes in weather patterns, and more limited access to services. Enabling social protection systems to better serve rural populations require promoting the participation of representatives of rural populations in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of social protection policies and schemes, as well as adapting policies, programs, and delivery mechanisms to the specificities of rural populations. For instance, policy and legislation, compulsory contribution systems in Algeria for self-employment agricultural workers within mechanisms facilitating gradual affiliation and contribution over a three-year period. In examples of programs which are adjusting values of transfer to household size and rural areas, complementing social protection and climate smart services to support climate adaptation. Finally, delivery mechanisms. First, e payments to simplify access to nomadic, nomadic populations, example in Kenya, hunger safety net program. Second, the use of farmer registries to identify the poor farmers and the extent of social protection to them. All these elements are central and is something that we need to learn. So social protection is beyond the mandate and the capacity of any single agency. Consequently, close collaboration across agencies and partners in different areas of specialized specialization is fundamental. Within this in mind, FAO is organizing this dialogue, the Dialogue on Social Protection series, the Dialogue on Social Protection. This dialogue series is a contribution to reinforce collaboration across partners. More specifically, the objective of the series are to raise awareness on the role of universal social protection in promoting more inclusive food system transformation, increase the understanding of the respective mandates of different partners and how these can each contribute to more inclusive food system transformation. And finally, to facilitate experience sharing and learning across countries and between development partners, including the UN and non-UN agencies. Today's sessions, Pathways for Extending Universal Coverage of Social Protection, is the first in a series. Other sessions are planned, including on shock responsive social protection and the humanitarian development peace, Nexus, and also on social protection as a key strategy for agri-food system transformation. And finally, social protection, economic inclusion, and climate change. So colleagues, this was just a simple introduction of what is coming forward and where we believe that this social protection dialogue will help all of us to learn more of how we can use this extremely important safety net mechanism to help the most vulnerable people and to reduce inequalities. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for this introduction, Maximo, and thank you for highlighting the urgency of addressing hunger and malnutrition and the important role that food systems can actually play in achieving the SDG as long as uh, they are inclusive as was said. Uh, you also draw attention to the important role that social protection can play in making food systems more inclusive and stress that for social protection to be able to fulfill this role, coverage needs to be expanded and social protection system needs to be able to respond to the specificities of people living in rural area, which, which is where the poor are most concentrated. Uh, I've also noted that in, in his presentation, Mr. Torero appreciated the role that this dialogue series can play in facilitating learning and experience sharing and in creating greater awareness of how different partners can support national social protection systems, ultimately giving visibility to the impact social protection can have in achieving more inclusive and rural uh, food systems transformation. So to complete this introduction, I would like now to give the floor to Ms. Natalia Winder-Rossi, who is the Director of Social Policy 
and social protection at UNICEF. And Natalia will present more specifically the topic at hand. And uh, Natalia, I'm very pleased to give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. Good morning, afternoon, uh, colleagues and distinguished uh, delegates. I'm very excited to be here, to be able to partner with ILO and FAO on this very important dialogue series, and of course, to see uh, former colleagues and, and friends. Um, let me give me two seconds so I can share my, my screen. Um, one second. We've been doing this for a long time, but we always are a little bit technologically challenged. But I think you can, you should be able to see it by now. Uh, please do let me know yes. if you can all see the slide. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to to give a, a lot of overview from UNICEF perspective um, around, you know, how we want to work around the importance of social protection, the move towards universal systems, and of course the specific uh, elements around children and families. I think very much aligned to what uh, Maximo just presented in, in, in the previous session. Um, yes, we are in a very critical moment and unprecedented increase in poverty um, and inequality. And where we're zooming in around children, which are most of the time most likely to be in living in poverty than adults, we, have, we now have an estimation of having an additional 100 million children living in poverty due to the compounding impacts of climate conflict and COVID-19. And this is a phenomenon that is not only impacting low income countries, but it's also across the board in middle income and high income countries even. And it's not an issue only in the in an aggregate number, so more children or more families living in poverty, but also a, a change in the in the profiles of families and children living in poverty. More uh, in urban areas than before, although of course rural areas continue to be the, the, the mass uh, concentration of poverty, but now we see an increase in more children and families in urban areas living in poverty, in conflict and humanitarian contexts, in families that were uh, pro uh, working in the informal or care sector. We acknowledge that it's a poverty, but also a care crisis where women and girls have been disproportionately impacted, uh, having a, at a higher risk of losing jobs and economic instability, as well as arising rising care responsibilities and, and impacting their, their labor participation. And also understanding, and even before the crisis, we had a, a massive gap in terms of the financing of SDGs, particularly SDGs focused on, on, on social sectors and, and including social protection. Social spending is at, a, is at risk. And when we are in a context of economic com contraction, unfortunately, is the first, the first sectors that are cut or, or, or affected. And also we know that we are in a very critical debt crisis, which um, as a, based on a recent study that, that we did, most of countries are spending more in debt repayments than in education, social protection or, or health combined. Um, we know that social protection was one of the critical pillars of the COVID-19 emergency response. We know from a lot of the work that we've done in partnership um, with FAO and, and, and other colleagues that there are solid evidence around the impacts of, of social protection across different outcomes, um, affecting children, families, but also for those women. Um, and I think I, I'm, I'm, I think that, that also the response changed a little bit the narrative of, around social protection, that it's critical for the poorest, but it's not only relevant for the poorest, but is an issue for, for every single um, population, uh, an issue that needs to be a focus of the response, not just as an emergency short-term element, but as a core pillar of inclusive recovery and resilient um, societies. We know that it's a recognized strategy for reducing child poverty, but also to address many of the climate and conflict related risks, as we've all recognized in the, in the series of global commitments, such as the grand bargain and, and others. And, and I think more, more uh, recent, as um, I think also Ma Maximo um, uh, highlighted, our commitment as, as agencies and as partners to really move towards the progressive realization of universal coverage, where we see as UNICEF universal child benefits as a critical entry point to move towards universal universal coverage. Um, Maximo was very clear on, on the critical gaps that we, till, we still have in terms of, of coverage of social protection. And when we zoom in on children, we have that only one in four children are, are have access to any form of social protection. And this coverage, unfortunately, is lowest in places with high poverty rates and including, of course, in humanitarian context. But I think it's important to bear in mind that, yes, coverage is our main concern. And without expansion of coverage, we cannot realize any of the impacts and the potential of social protection. 
But I think the crisis also was very clear in highlighting all other types of gaps that we also need to pay close attention. For instance, in terms of adequacy, the effective reach of a specific populations, such as girl, women, children with disability, migrants, um, children in ethnic groups in different areas. Just to give an example, uh, based on a tracker um, led by UN Women, we know that the COVID response was gender blind or neutral, where less than one in five social protection measures address gender, regardless of the party and, and, and care impacts across, across the board. We also know that we need to do much more in enhancing the specific design of the social protection programs to really address the specific vulnerabilities of specific sectors um, in terms of design, in terms of the size of the transfer, in terms of the types of interventions that we are putting forth and we're scaling up. And maybe third, um, even though we've done, I think, a lot of, and there's been a lot of spotlight around the importance of income-based transfers, cash transfers, and others, um, we still have a long to do in terms of other critical interventions within the social protection system that can be equally important and if impactful, such as health insurance, affordable childcare, family-friendly policies, um, which were not and continue not to be highlighted or included in the systematic response um, across COVID, but also across other types of, of crises. A, a gap in terms of what we call risk informed programming. So even though countries with very strong national social protection systems were better able to respond to the crises, we still we still saw that there were uh, the need to create other parallel systems to to cover critical populations that were not. Um, in, the, in the social protection system, such as migrants and informal workers, for example, um, even though there were some elements of horizontal expansion mean or vertical expansion of systems, there was some limitations in terms of the timeliness of the response and the type of, 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 um, of programs that we saw on, on the table. And right now, the, the risks of some of that critical expansions to be contracted and not systematically integrated with designing systems. I think we're in a moment where we need to focus on coverage, but we also need to think about the opportunity on, of addressing such as these critical gaps in terms of design, including making sure the programs are more shock responsive, that integrate systematically the elements of risk um, as an element of good programming, not, not as seen as an add-on for development or an additional element to take into account, but as an essential element to make sure that we can realize, as I said before, the potential and the impacts that we can see and we know that social protection can, can provide. Um, and then thirdly, the, the critical gap around sustainable financing. I think we we there was an, definitely an unprecedented response, uh, very commendable that many uh, member states across the board really prioritize social protection dur during the response, even with existing uh, fiscal space and, and making sure that they were putting on the table many financing uh, modalities. So proving that when there's political real, uh, uh, will, we can find the, the economic means to, to, to expand social protection. But, but we are, of course, at a risk of an even recovery, where not every, every country was able to, to make that change, to make that leap. We still have, based on ILO's uh, estimation, a, a gap in terms of how to uh, sustain investments in social protection um, across, across countries. And, and of course, the, the importance to make sure that, once again, this is prioritized and not seen as an afterthought when we're, when we're discussing financing strategies for, for recovery. And I think right now we have a very strong uh, partnership at the UN level and based uh, on the leadership of the Secretary General that prioritize the global accelerator on social protection and, and jobs for, its, for a just transition as one of the critical elements of the, of the common agenda. The importance of really elevating social protection, as I said, not, not just as an emergency and short term response, but as a, cr a critical pillar of, of recovery. And uh, very pleased that this uh, Friday, as part of the UN Gen General Assembly High Level Week, we will be discussing the importance of the accelerator and the importance to really take advantage of the momentum and, and scale up uh, the key changes that we need to make to, to see uh, the results that we, that we want in terms of social protection and, and coverage. Um, as Yuna said, we've been, of course, committing and working in this area for, for a long time and supporting different countries around, um, you know, making sure that we can enhance the impact and the long term sustainability of programs. And we do have a new strategic plan that started this year, which reaffirms our commitment to universal coverage and, and building systems, but also enhancing our work on critical game changers that, that we think are going to make sure that, that the impact is, is there in terms of gender transform transformative systems, in terms of 
of inclusive systems, in terms of making sure that we have the critical financing and um, uh, strategies for social protection, and uh, uh, scaling up our comprehensive approach in fragile humanitarian context, making sure the systems are risk, risk informed and shock responsive, as well as being able to deliver life saving cash when, when needed. Just a few points on, on, our, on our vision around universal child, uh, child benefits, which we see as a critical entry point, um, one building block as we think around the progressive move towards universal coverage. Um, in terms of you know its its critical poverty impact, the the potential of political support given that it's covering a broad range of, of families and sectors, um, its potential of in, in strengthening the social uh, contract as of course a shared commitment to the well-being and development of, of countries' children and, and future generations, addressing stigma that enable families and children to participate fully in their communities, and of course reduce stigma that is associated with with poverty and inequality, but also as a, as a base or a critical entry point to make sure that we have coverage, but then we are better able to um, enter and, and integrate other elements that make social protection impactful in terms of design, inclusive design, and, and risk-informed design. Um, I think a critical point that when we think and talk about universality, including universal child benefits, there's also there's always this perception that you know nobody can think about universal systems and unless they're they're fully developed, unless there is you know uh, sustained uh, sustained growth. And I think it's important. Um, and the reason we sh I wanted to include this slide is that in many contexts that right now. Uh, have institutionalized universal systems or universal child benefits, they started to think and they started to, to prioritize this work even um, in, in earlier in their development, um, which of course with very progressive paths um, towards um, universality and with different different uh, and, and mixed financing strategies to reach to reach that goal. Um, and my last slide is to, to, to provide some examples on, on countries that are um, you know, very different stages of development that have been already starting and committed to the importance of universality, um, where they've integrated and realized that having um, child grants as, as an entry point is, is not only possible, but as, as, a, as a critical entry point to start thinking about a, a most comprehensive, inclusive, and important system, such as the Gate of Armenia, Burundi, and many others included in, in, in this slide. Um, let me finish by, by saying that we are in a very important momentum that I think there's there's commitment and recognition of the role of social protection to address many of, of the issues that we we encountered previous to that for the, for the pandemic. But it's also a moment where we need to come together in making sure that we make those critical changes uh, to address to address change. Um, and again, uh, I hope that uh, we can continue to to work together as a, as a one year family with the support of, of many, many of you to make sure that we realize this this critical goal. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, uh, Natalia, on behalf of UNICEF, and uh, thank you for, for partnering with us in this uh, in this series. Thank you also for reconfirming the proven impact of social protection in reducing poverty, speci specifically child poverty, and in achieving uh, greater gender equality and inclusion. I think you also pointed clearly to the, the large gaps in coverage that still remain, but beyond that, to the importance of ensuring the adequacy of a social protection scheme, as well as the importance of increasing and sustaining uh, financing for social protection. Thank you also for highlighting the, 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 the vision and the efforts undertaken by uh, UNICEF on the universal child benefit, which are indeed uh, uh, so important. So thank you again, uh, Natalia. And, uh, and now, before we hear from our, our other speaker, I would like to, to play the video message that we have received from His Excellency Ambassador Villegas permanent representative of Argentina to the UN in Geneva and president of the UN uh, Human Rights Council. Dear participants, it is a pleasure for me to be part of this important dialogue on social protection organized by FAO Liaison Office with the United Nations in Geneva and partner agencies such as ILO and UNICEF. The world is enduring several crises at the same time, all of which have huge human rights impact and long-lasting consequences. The COVID-19 pandemic, with a weak recovery and the risk of stagflation, climate change, and more recently, the war in the heart of Europe. 
The occurrence of these world-shaping events simultaneously magnifies their impact and poses challenges that cannot be addressed in an isolated manner. Human rights are severely impacted by these events, but at the same time, the human rights perspective is the solution to overcome these events. A global food, fuel, and finance crisis now risks plunging millions into food insecurity and poverty. 1.7 billion people in over 100 countries are severely exposed to at least one of these three crises. It is my firm belief that a human rights-based approach is the best way to reverse these negative trends and to address these challenges. In that regard, we need to recall that social protection is a human right enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But yet, today, four billion people, more than half of the world's population, still do not have access to any social protection. Investment in social protection as a key instrument for poverty reduction and inclusive growth, including in rural areas, can lead to more productive societies by providing better access to food, water, health, shelter, and schooling. Lack of investment in social security, on the other hand, can result in arrested development and may lead to protest and social unrest. States recognize the important role of social protection as a stabilizer during the COVID-19 pandemic. They adopted several innovative measures, such as expanding the coverage of social protection to informal workers, migrants, and specific vulnerable populations, including a gender responsive perspective, leveraging digital innovation in delivery mechanisms of social protection, and enacting legislative reforms to support employees and the self-employed. Beyond the human rights imperative, Emerging evidence from the COVID-19 pandemic underscores the power of universal social protection systems. Universal systems enable countries to scale social protection more effectively and efficiently. Almost all countries that were able to fully implement a first wave of payments within a few months leveraged existing registries and identification systems with high or almost universal coverage. It is imperative, therefore, that we continue discussing both how to mobilize domestic resources as well as ways in which international cooperation and debt relief can contribute to provide sufficient fiscal space for states to invest in social protection and advance towards the achievement of the SDGs. That's why today's meeting is of utmost importance. It is an opportunity to catalyze synergies among different actors, including states, UN system agencies, and other development partners on achieving the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and towards delivering progress on strengthening and extending social protection systems as a key element of strategies seeking to promote resilient, inclusive, and sustainable agri-food systems. I wish you all the year participants a fruitful discussion. Many thanks. Thank you very much for this message, Ambassador Villegas. Uh, you have reminded us that social protection is a human right enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but that in spite of this, 4 billion people are not still enjoying access to any form of social protection. Uh, you pointed out that investing in social protection, including in rural areas, is necessary for more productive societies and drew attention to the importance of mobilizing domestic resources for expanding access to social protection to all. So you told us that the international community needs to collaborate with states in supporting them to mobilize. Uh, the resources they need. So thank you very much for that. Je voudrais maintenant donner la parole à notre uh, première intervenant, son excellence, uh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur Omar Zniber, représentant permanent du Maroc auprès des Nations Unies à Genève. 
Monsieur l'ambassadeur, vous avez la parole. And I would like to remind participants to open the chat box to read the English translation of the ambassador's address. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, vous avez la parole. Thank you so much, uh, dear Mr. Grosjean. Uh, indeed, I have prepared my intervention in French language. It could have been possible, of course, to do it uh, in English, but uh, I was informed that uh, equally, uh, I could use the uh, French language, uh, I mean, uh, from which I could be probably uh, better uh, understood. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je pense que le sujet que vous avez choisi cet après-midi, je vous en félicite, comme cela d'ailleurs a été souligné par les intervenants prédécesseurs, est devenu d'une extrême importance pour tous les pays et pour la communauté internationale en tant que telle. Euh, en guise d'introduction, je voudrais juste dire, je crois que tout a été dit sur le caractère fondamental, essentiel de l'universalisation de la protection sociale, y compris dans le monde rural. Je, je n'y reviendrai pas. Je voudrais juste dire que pour nous au Maroc, c'est une question euh, également euh, qui fait l'objet d'un intérêt particulier à tel point que nous l'appelons chez nous un chantier royal, c'est-à-dire où le chef de l'État, sa majesté le roi Mohamed VI, s'implique personnellement, euh, étape par étape, depuis le début, euh, pour accompagner cette universalisation chez nous au Maroc. À côté de cela, naturellement, toutes les institutions, tous les acteurs sont mobilisés d'une manière exceptionnelle. Je parle du Parlement, je, naturellement, ça va sans dire du gouvernement, mais aussi des syndicats, euh, de la société civile plus globalement, et bien sûr des représentants des, des employeurs et, et des employés, tellement le sujet, naturellement, nécessite euh, euh, l'intervention et euh, les efforts de tous. Alors, tout cela a débouché sur l'annonce par sa majesté le roi Mohamed VI de manière solennelle le 29 juillet 2020 euh, de, de, du projet d'universaliser euh, la protection sociale au Maroc d'ici la fin de 2025. Selon les étapes que j'ai déjà soulignées, la première est celle de la généralisation de, de l'assurance maladie obligatoire, dite chez nous à mot, durant les années 21 et 22. C'est-à-dire que d'ici la fin de l'année, de l'année en cours, la généralisation de l'assurance maladie sera offerte à tous les citoyens marocains. Deuxièmement, la généralisation des allocations familiales avant la fin de 2024, progressivement. Troisièmement, l'élargissement en l'an 2025 de l'assiette des adhérents au régime de retraite pour inclure les personnes qui exercent un emploi et ne bénéficient aujourd'hui d'aucune pension beaucoup d'artisans, beaucoup de, 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 de petites professions dites euh, libérales, euh, cela est bien connu au Maroc, bénéficieront de, désormais de cet élargissement euh, pour, au régime de retraite d'ici 2025. Et enfin, la, la généralisation de l'indemnité pour perte d'emploi également pour 2025. Donc vous voyez, c'est un chantier très important, un chantier énorme pour un pays comme le Maroc, parce que je voudrais le souligner, non? mon pays s'est consacré, disons, ces deux dernières décennies à un programme euh, essentiel de, de mise en route des infrastructures de façon très prononcée. Les autoroutes, les aéroports, les ports, euh, dans le domaine de la santé également, dans le domaine de la logistique, etc. etc. Et bien sûr, l'urbanisme dans les villes, tout cela a transformé réellement le visage du Maroc. Mais en même temps, euh, cet investissement aussi important n'a pas été accompagnée sur le plan social par les mêmes efforts. Et cela a été relevé, malgré naturellement la prise en conscience de, du caractère essentiel du développement social, du développement humain chez nos membres. Donc, il s'agit aujourd'hui de se concentrer de la même manière que cela a été fait sur la question des infrastructures, sur la question, si vous voulez, de, 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 de la connectivité, etc., dans le pays, de se concentrer de la même manière dans le volet social. Alors, cela... Juste pour vous donner une idée, ce plan qui va jusqu'en 2025 s'illustre aujourd'hui par l'adoption de 22 décrets. Le décret, c'est quand même un, un, une décision gouvernementale qui demande aussi beaucoup d'efforts. Ce n'est pas un simple arrêté ministériel, etc. Ça implique l'ensemble du gouvernement, avec aussi l'ambition d'ouvrir aux travailleurs non salariés, comme je dis, l'accès à l'assurance maladie obligatoire, ce qui fera qu'à la fin de cette année, l'ensemble des Marocains seront euh, concernés. Sur le plan budgétaire, il faut aussi donner ce chiffre. La gestion de ces programmes à l'horizon 2025 nécessitera d'allouer un montant annuel total de 51 milliards de, de dirhams, un peu plus de 5 milliards de dollars, 
dont la moitié sera prise en charge par l'État marocain. Donc, ce n'est pas uniquement des paroles avancées. Il y a un, le plan de financement est arrêté, bien précisément, euh, aussi bien du côté gouvernemental que de, des autres contributeurs, des autres acteurs. Maintenant, laissez-moi aussi en quelques minutes me, euh, me concentrer sur l'impact de, de cette politique, de cette stratégie puisqu'il m'a été demandé d'agir, de, de, d'expliquer de, essentiellement le cas du Maroc, l'impact de cette stratégie sur le monde rural. En effet, en février 2020, la stratégie, ce qu'on appelle chez nous « Génération Green », nouvelle stratégie de développement du secteur agricole pour la période 2020-2030, et qui vient compléter un ensemble de plans et de programmes stratégiques également liés au développement du monde rural, tel que le plan de développement des énergies renouvelables, le programme prioritaire national d'approvisionnement non potable et d'irrigation, qui court jusqu'en 2027, la stratégie de développement du domaine forestier de 2020-2030, le programme de réduction des disparités territoriales et sociales, ou encore le deuxième programme national des routes rurales. Il s'agit de milliers de kilomètres, j'ai parlé des infrastructures, ça, ça, ça tombe aussi sur, dans le cadre de ce programme, les routes rurales qui sont chaque année élargies euh, par des milliers de kilomètres. Euh, voilà. Alors, L'élément central de cette nouvelle stratégie agricole est la valorisation de l'élément humain. Cela a été souligné très fortement cet après-midi. À travers l'émergence d'une nouvelle classe moyenne agricole et cela en permettant à 400 000 ménages d'accéder à la classe moyenne selon des critères retenus et d'y stabiliser 690 000 par le biais de quatre piliers. L'amélioration des revenus des agriculteurs, la généralisation de l'assurance agricole, comme pour le reste, l'alignement du salaire minimum agricole garanti au salaire minimum industriel dans le secteur du commerce et des professions libérales à l'horizon 2028, parce qu'on avait effectivement deux salaires minimums au Maroc qui seront alignés, le salaire minimum agricole étant nettement plus bas que l'autre, mais seront alignés selon le programme arrêté d'ici 2028. Et enfin, la mise en place d'un cadre spécial pour l'agriculteur, lui permettant, comme je l'ai bien souligné, de bénéficier des services de protection sociale. Concernant ce dernier pilier, qui nous intéresse particulièrement cet après-midi, et sachant que l'agriculture représente environ 40% des actifs occupés et jusqu'à 15% de la, du, du PIB, le ministère de l'Agriculture, en coopération avec les partenaires gouvernementaux ainsi que les fédérations et stations professionnelles agricoles, a réalisé une étude détaillée pour déterminer les catégories et les grilles de cotisation de la population des agriculteurs, puis lancer une campagne de collecte de données envie d'élaborer les listes des agriculteurs avec les informations requises. Cela a abouti à l'établissement du schéma suivant. La cotisation au régime de l'assurance maladie obligatoire a été déterminée entre 117 et 1080 dirhams, c'est-à-dire entre 11 et 100 francs suisses à peu près, selon les différentes catégories. En termes de résultats, et puis, le, depuis le lancement de cette campagne, 841 000 agriculteurs ont été inscrits jusqu'en mai dernier à la Caisse nationale de sécurité sociale sur les 1,6 million d'agriculteurs devant ont bénéficié dans un Et cela sans prendre en compte les membres de leur famille qui sont également bénéficiés. De manière générale, notre profonde conviction au Maroc est que les efforts entrepris pour la généralisation de la protection sociale en faveur de l'ensemble de la population mais en particulier des agriculteurs, et au-delà des avantages directs dont bénéficient ces derniers, aura un impact direct sur le développement du monde rural de manière plus globale. Cette généralisation permettra en premier lieu de préserver les équilibres sociaux en luttant contre la précarité. Elle permettra également, entre autres, d'accéder au travail décent, de lutter contre le travail des enfants et par conséquent contre la déscolarisation, de limiter l'exode rural, particulièrement marqué après la succession des différentes chasseresses qui malheureusement frappent le Maroc, et aussi de générer de nouvelles dynamiques sociales, à même de créer des opportunités d'emploi supplémentaires et de consolider en, en gros la croissance au niveau national. Je voudrais aussi insister sur un, un fait très important, c'est que le Maroc, dans ses politiques de coopération, sud-sud, en particulier avec nos voisins et frères africains, nous partageons ces expériences. Il y a un certain nombre de, de colloques, de séminaires, de rencontres, voire même de conférences qui se tiennent chez nous au Maroc sur ces thématiques pour que le Maroc puisse bénéficier de l'expérience des autres, avec y compris bien sûr la contribution 
des institutions internationales concernées, comme la vôtre, comme l'UNICEF, comme toutes les institutions euh, qui le bien sur le BIT. Et aussi, je voudrais en conclusion, euh, cher Monsieur Bourgon, dire que pour illustrer tout ce que je viens euh, de dire en termes de coopération au niveau international, régional et local, de rappeler que le Maroc organise à Marrakech du 24 au 28 octobre prochain le Forum mondial de la sécurité sociale sous le thème « La sécurité sociale pour des sociétés résilientes et inclusives » auquel euh, ce forum, euh, bien sûr, j'en suis persuadé, certaines et certains parmi les organisations que vous représentez contribueront de manière très, très prononcée, comme va le faire d'ailleurs le BIT et d'autres. Et je vous remercie. Voilà donc ce que j'avais à partager avec vous cet après-midi en, en ce qui concerne l'expérience du Maroc dans ce domaine, encore une fois, vital. Merci beaucoup. Je vous remercie beaucoup, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, pour votre intervention. Et il est clair que les efforts undertaken par le Maroc pour généraliser la sociale protection dans le pays sont considérables et les progrès faits sont impressifs sous le leadership du chef de l'État dans ce que nous pouvons décrire comme un effort social de la société. I was particularly interested in what you said about the, your conviction that the generalization of social protection for the entire population, and in particular for farmers, will have a direct impact on the development of the rural areas uh, more generally. Uh, also, thank you for highlighting the, the South-South cooperation dimension of your effort. So your, your expertise is benefiting other countries and you are benefiting also from, from the others. And for informing, uh, drawing attention on the World Social Security Forum uh, that will be held in Marrakech from 24 to 28 October. So thank you uh, very much, uh, Excellency, for, for your intervention. And we'll now uh, move to our next speaker and hear from uh, His Excellency Ambassador Pekstein de Beutzwerbe, the permanent representative of Belgium to the UN in Geneva. Ambassador Pekstein, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think I, I can be fairly short because much has been already said by the previous speakers. But let me first say that um, universal social, social protection is a priority for Belgium. And this week uh, in New York, actually, our prime minister will join the UN Secretary General um, and uh, ILO Director General Guy Ryder um to uh, in promoting uh, the global accelerator on on job and and social protection so a high level event in euro in in new york during the the ga special week um also our minister during the um, ilo um conference uh, in june uh, highlighted social protection as as a priority as as a strategic uh, priority for the organization Um, and uh, let me also mention, uh, speaking about ILO, that Belgium has the honor to chair the tripartite working group on the review of ILO standards. And for the last two years, uh, a key question uh, has been to extend social security instruments and benefits uh, for occupational accidents and diseases to the agricultural um, sector, to agri agricultural workers. And that brings me then to agriculture indeed. And um, I think it's, it has been said probably, um, it is estimated that, that between 70% and 50% of the world's workers are in the agricultural sector. And um, a recent joint ILO-FAO report indicates that uh, the agricultural sector concentrates many challenges uh, to decent work. Uh, these include poverty, informality, and uh, child labor. Um, so I think it's really great that uh, we see this uh, cooperation between FAO and ILO on, on these issues. And I, I would certainly encourage uh, both organizations to continue uh, doing that. And I think this webinar is, is also a good illustration of that. Let me know, perhaps mention um, a few issues um, that require uh, further, further work and reflection and discussion. And also this uh, webinar can be the opportunity for, for doing that. 
The first one is, is finance. Uh, financing universal social protection, that's a big challenge, of course. Uh, we're speaking about you know, big amount here. And uh, clearly we need to involve the international financial institution, the Bretton Woods uh, institution in, into this uh, discussions in order to have the, the, the financial means uh, necessary. The, the second um, issue uh, in my view is, is really to create um, an inter-agency, inter-organizations um, movement in, in direction of universal social protection. As we heard, uh, I think it's Maximo told, told us that, there is already um, a, a task force um, between uh, the different organizations. That's a very good start, uh, but we really need to, I think, um, go uh, beyond that, give more visibility, have a real partnership uh, to, to make it happen. Uh, then a uh, third uh, difficult issue is uh, how to include the informal sector, uh, the informal workers uh, in a social protection scheme. Uh, that's not easy, that's very complex. And finally, I would say um, national ownership. That's, to me, that's very key. If we don't have national ownership, it's not going to work. I mean, we can have a very nice program, but we need really, at the country level, we need to see, um, you know, the will, the political will to mobilize uh, the means to have the will to go for it. And that's the only... Um, condition uh, for success in, in my view. And I must say, uh, we just heard the, uh, my colleague, uh, my good colleague, uh, the ambassador of Morocco. Uh, and I think what he said, it's exactly that what that we need, a, a national vision uh, to, to make it happening. So uh, congratulations to Morocco really. And uh, I hope that uh, other countries will, will follow that example and uh, we really have as i say we have to to create a movement to create a coalition uh, to make it happen thank you very much thank you very much excellency for for your remarks for reaffirming that universal social protection is a top priority for your government that is championed as you said uh, at the highest level of uh, of government including this week in uh, in uh, in new york and for reminding us of the of the particularity of the of, of the agriculture sector with indeed a lot of informality and for giving us a, I would say almost a roadmap for what we should cover in the in, in the coming dialogues as part of this series in, uh, as well as was already mentioned by some of the previous speakers in terms of uh, of financing of the social protection involving the, the Bretton Woods institutions the the importance of creating, as you said, an interagency uh, movement to, to go beyond what exists uh, there, uh, to include the, the informal sector and to, above all, ensure uh, national ownership. So thank you very much uh, for, your, for your comment and support. Uh, we'll certainly keep you involved as we move forward with this, uh, with this series. Uh, we know uh, here from uh, from two other colleagues, uh, respectively, uh, Ms. Rima El Aja, head of economic and marketing services in the Ministry of Agriculture of Lebanon, and Mr. S Steve Shiwele, assistant uh, director of social welfare in the Ministry of Community Development and Social Welfare of Zambia. Uh, Ms. El Aja will first talk. Uh, to us about the experience of Lebanon in the expansion of coverage of social insur insurance to small family farmers. Uh, Ms. Uh, Aja, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Go ahead.
Ajar, I, I believe you can stop. Yes. Uh, okay. Can you put it just in, uh, just in increase the screen, please? There seems to be an echo huh? uh, when you speak. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, very well, please go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so let me start. Okay, I will be talking about the expanding of the coverage of social protection to vulnerable farmers in Lebanon through the farmer registry establishment, what we are doing now. Uh, can you please move to the next slide? Okay, so I will start with a brief about the country and the agricultural sector. Lebanon now is going through multi-severe, multi-phased crisis, causing multidimensional poverty to nearly double, which is nearly doubled from 42% uh, in uh, 2019 to 82% in 2021. The impact of the crisis is especially acute on the farmers, you know, and the agricultural sectors, which uh, who are the traditionally the poorest segment of the population. Uh, I will give you just a brief about uh, number, total numbers of holders in uh, Lebanon. It's 170,000, 8.6% of uh, which uh, are females. Uh, unfortunately, these data are from the last census in 2010. We don't have uh, updated information on the farmers. And uh, uh, the permanent family agriculture labors uh, 165,000, uh, so this is a big number in uh, most of the families. Um, can we go to the next slide? The informality of the agriculture sector in Lebanon partially explains the limited access to social protection of farmers and fishers. The main legislation related to the labors excluded uh, all the agriculture sectors. The Lebanon Labor Code in 1946 excluded farm and farmers uh, workers also from the code. The code of obligation and contracts, even though it covers the category of agriculture workers and domestic worker in private home, it does not mention any intervention related to the organization of or protection of work relation within the agriculture sectors. Also, the Social Security Code in 62, it, which is the base of the establishment of the National Social Security Fund, also in the first phase, uh, social, the agriculture workers were excluded and it was added in the second phase in, uh, only uh, for the Lebanese permanent agriculture workers. Also farmers and fishers can still benefit from the following social protection schemes from the National Poverty Targeting Program. And this is issued, this is food e-card issued for the extreme poor Lebanese uh, population. Health covered by the Ministry of Public Health, uh, provide health assistance to all uninsured Lebanese estimated to be around 50% of the population. Health and social services within the Ministry of Social Affairs also provide primary health services in the, at the regional uh, uh, centers. The High Relief Council, which is a multi-ministerial ministerial entity charged with providing emergency relief in times of natural and or man-made disasters. And also the Ministry of Agriculture who provides support and subsidies like supporting access to agriculture inputs, for example, for small scale farmers. And it was done via vouchers uh, and uh, multi donors vouchers program in 2021, 2022, for uh, the last two years uh, to 36,000 farmers, uh, like a total as example of $10 million. Uh, can we go to the next slide? The National Agricultural Strategy in 2025 
also, uh, which was developed also with the support of AO, uh, also uh, the main pillars also strengthen and uh, uh, focus on the support uh, uh, of the farmers and developing of social protection to them. So the, for the pillar one in the first program, ensure and facilitate access to inputs and tools to maintain agriculture production capacity, like in kind and cash assistance, uh, like subsidies and vouchers. And the uh, program two also facilitate access to subsidized agri loan for farmers and small and medium enterprise. And the pillar five and the program four create enabling conditions for the development of agriculture insurance, also to mitigate the impact of natural disasters. Program five develop a social protection system for vulnerable farmers, farm workers, producers, and fishers ensuring the coverage by the social insurance system, including medical insurance, also uh, ensuring the coverage of eligible farmers by the National Poverty Targeting Program. Next slide, please. So the establishment of a farmer registry was coming as a response uh, to this. Uh, uh, a scoping mission uh, led also by FAO in 2015 determined that the farmer registry is one step to guarantee a better coverage of social protection of farmers. Agriculture is not a former employment sector in Lebanon. We have no existing social security benefits for farmers and farm workers, and we need to expand, we need, there's a need for expansion of social protection coverage to rural areas. In fact, the major activities still need to be implemented to guarantee a legal access to social security for farmers and ensure the financial feasibility of this object. The collection of information through the farmer registry and the extension of coverage of the NPTP to farmers will be essential to move forward in this process. Next slide. So for coming up to the farmer registry establishment, it's a long journey and most of the action was with support also of FAO. Uh, the journey started with the statistical farmer registry management within the, but this was the data of uh, the census 2010, and it was only statistical farmer registry. Then a study visit to France with the TIEX program explained and clarified the difference and the need and how will be the need to, uh, develop and establish an administrative farmer registry. Then a pilot uh, phase of the farmer registry with FAO project in 2017 was uh, uh, conducted in two different regions in, uh, in Lebanon and uh, 500 farmers was, uh, were registered at that time. And all the need for the registration was assessed with all concerned sectors Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Industry and Agriculture, Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, Ministry of Economy and Trade, and we get the recommendations and the learning session that we are using now for the establishment of the actual and the real farmer registry. Also, a draft law was prepared in the first stage, and this law was revised in uh, 2021 and uh, it was presented to the parliament and referred to the Council of March uh, of Ministers and still there, we didn't yet uh, uh, get the, all the comments on it. Also a participation to the course e-coaching on social protection towards responsive system uh, with, uh, it was, uh, with the FAO and the ILO in uh, May 2021 also improve the knowledge, the knowledge regarding the extension of social protection in agri sector. And now uh, going to the phase of the uh, farmer registry, the software now is ready to use. All the elements were uh, prepared uh, with consultation with the different departments within the ministry to see all the needs that we need to, to, to include in it. And we are in the preparation phase for a launch in, um, in two months maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> Next slide. So what does the farmer register provide? The farmer register will provide a unique identification of the farmer for any commitment in the agriculture sector. Also, 
a transparent and fair distribution of the subsidies when we will have it, when we will have any subsidies, will be also the farmer register will be a reliable source of information for agriculture policy and the statistics. And the location of parcel and land cover, we will use several layers uh, within the farmer register to confirm the, the, the land and the parcel. And the farmer registry will be uh, easy to will help and uh, to record and to control whatever declared by the farmer for any social and for the social benefits and for the subsidies. Next slide, please. So the farmer registry we are establishing will uh, is composed from four modules. The farm, the first module componing the farm data. So all the farm assets, the animals, the machinery, information about the workers and the farmers livelihood conditions, including socioeconomic and demographic information. Uh, the second module, this is the land parcel and location identification data. This is a GIS based uh, module also to, um, uh, to identify the land parcel and the farm. The third module of the farmer registry will include farmers targeting module. This module enab enables the creation of sub registries through the class reclassification of farmers according to specific criteria and indicators using screening, weighting, and ranking process for the farmers. And to finally uh, getting the information to the four, uh, fourth module, which is the voucher scheme management module, and which will be uh, directed for agriculture support for, uh, for sure and will be automatically generated uh, vouchers. Next, please. So this is an example just, uh, just to have a view on the, on, the farmer, uh, uh, on the farmer registry, how it's looked like, with also the land parcel identification uh, uh, maps and which will be drawn in the, in the map directly. Next, please. So in conclusion, by creating an official list of farmers and fishers also, which are included in the, in the farmer registry for Lebanon, and through coordination with all relevant institutions, the farmer registry can create a legally recognized list of farmers who could be enrolled into a specific social insurance regime in Lebanon knowing that 75% of farmers are not registered in the National Social Security Fund. Also, the farmer registry will allow to expand the coverage of social protection to rural areas by effectively identifying farmers and fishers in need according to their livelihoods and socioeconomic characteristics and enhancing their access to agriculture and social services. Also, the farmer registry will guarantee the availability of reliable information and timely information for the formulation of agriculture policy that are knowledge-based and transparent, including policy pertaining to promoting economic inclusion and rural livelihoods. And that's all. Thank you for... Uh... Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ajar, for your intervention. Thanks a lot for explaining how those informally employed in the agriculture sector in Lebanon uh, face specific challenges in uh, indeed accessing social protection and, uh, and for showing how to help overcome uh, some of these challenges. Uh, you are adapting the farmer registry so that it can be used for expanding access to social insurance among small scale farmers. Uh, this is an interesting example of how different sectors, agriculture and social security can come together to expand access. So uh, thank you very much. I think it's, it's again a very telling experience. Um, and I would all like to, to move to uh, Mr. Chiwene, uh, who is uh, going to, to talk to us about the, the experience of Zambia in the expansion of a social cash transfer program. Uh, Mr. Shiwele, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. 
Thank you very much, uh, um, moderator, and uh, apologies uh, for joining the meeting a little uh, late. I had a few uh, technical glitches, uh, but uh, we uh, managed to sort out that. Um, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, good morning, uh, depending on uh, where you are on the globe. Um, as already introduced, my name is uh, Stephen Chwele. Um, I am a project uh, uh, coordinator uh, for the Jewel um, uh, project, uh, specifically uh, focusing on the, on the component of a social cash transfer uh, project implementation uh, unit uh, supported uh, by uh, the World Bank and other uh, cooperating partners. So I work in the department, uh, in the Ministry of our Community Development and, and uh, Social Services. Uh, before I proceed, uh, allow me just to thank the organizers uh, of this um, uh, event uh, for giving us uh, on, on an opportunity as a ministry, you know, to showcase uh, what we are trying to do in, in, in the advancement of the social, um, uh, of social protection agenda. Um, my presentation basically will, will focus on um, uh, like the moderator indicated on, on, on the expansion of a social cash transfer and uh, also the policies, uh, programs that have uh, informed uh, this uh, expansion. And uh, uh, we we'll also talk about uh, the role of uh, our cooperating partners in, in, in the programming of a social cash transfer, then uh, future plans uh, are for expansion. So this is the outline of, of the presentation. Uh, we'll look at the introduction, uh, program objectives, uh, the coverage of, of the social cash transfer over time, uh, uh, drivers of uh, growth, expansion, role of our cooperation partners, indicated, and the future plans. Uh, next. Yes. Um, like, like I indicated, uh, I, I work in the Ministry of uh, Community Work and uh, Social Services, and um, uh, the Ministry has a mandate uh, to deliver um, uh, the social assistance uh, programs. And um, we're talking about uh, programs like uh, uh, social cash transfer itself, the food security pack, um, uh, supporting women livelihoods, uh, public welfare assistance scheme, and uh, also women empowerment. But um, I must indicate that uh, social cash transfer is uh, the flagship uh, program. And uh, it was um, uh, started in, in the year 2003 in uh, Southern province, uh, Kalomo district, uh, with uh, only 169 uh, beneficiaries. And um, after some time, uh, this was extended uh, to uh, three other districts, uh, Kazungula, Chipata, Monze, and uh, uh, Katete. So uh, from the year 2003, uh, the social cash transfer has uh, undergone uh, a lot of changes. It has, it has evolved into a national program. So this started as, as a project uh, supported by GIZ and uh, now it's become um, uh, a national program, though it's uh, running a, as, a, as a project. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to announce to you that uh, we are in all the communities, we are in all the 116 districts, we are in all the provinces. And uh, uh, right now we, we stand at uh, nine, over nine, Hundred and seventy-three thousand uh, uh, households in, in case in, in terms of um, uh, the households that uh, we are supporting. So the the, the growth has been um, um, has, has taken place because of the commitment uh, that uh, uh, we we have uh, you know from the ministry the commitment you know uh, from uh, government and. Uh, other cooperating partners, and I must uh, indicate that uh, we have uh, received a goodwill uh, from uh, governments or the successive governments, and also the cooperating partners who've worked so hard uh, to ensure that uh, 
uh, we are where we are right now. Next slide. So in, in terms of uh, objectives, uh, uh, the objective of uh, the social cash transfer program is uh, to contribute uh, to the reduction of uh, extreme poverty and also the um, uh, intergenerational transfer of our uh, poverty. And uh, we tr try to look at uh, um, uh, five main areas uh, in terms of our specific objectives as uh, income, education, health, uh, food security, and uh, livelihoods. So on, uh, on, on income, uh, we try to uh, supplement and not to replace uh, household uh, income. And uh, education, we try to contribute to the increase of a number of children enrolled and uh, attending uh, primary school education, especially uh, uh, those that are coming from uh, social cash transfer households. And uh, on health, we try to contribute to the reduction of uh, uh, illnesses, uh, uh, mortality issues, and uh, also um, morbidity, uh, focusing on uh, children under uh, uh, five years old. And then uh, food security, we try also to contribute uh, to, to household uh, uh, food uh, security. Uh, livelihoods, so we, we're also trying to uh, contribute to the increase of a number of households that are owning uh, assets and uh, if you look at uh, the assessments, uh, the studies that have been conducted uh, so far, they point uh, uh, to the fact that uh, 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 households receiving uh, social cash transfer have been able to make uh, progress in in these uh, five uh, areas that uh, have been highlighted. You can go down. Yes, so basically uh, this graph uh, just shows um, how we have uh, moved um, in terms of uh, uh, expansion of uh, social cash transfer. Uh, like I indicated, uh, we started in the year 2003 with only 169 uh, beneficiaries. And um, in 2003, uh, 2006, we were able to move uh, to 2,807. And uh, the, the scale up uh, continued. Um, uh, right now, we are at um, uh, 973,000 households. Of, and um, uh, before the end of the year, we have a projection uh, to reach uh, 100, 1,027,000 uh, households. That is uh, before the end of the year. We've uh, started the uh, scale up activities, uh, our targeting uh, process. Uh, last for a period of uh, about two to three months. And uh, before the end of the year, we will be able to onboard uh, uh, new beneficiaries uh, on the program. Yeah, so in, in, in terms of uh, uh, the target, uh, we, we, we are targeting uh, five main uh, groups or categories. We, we're targeting the female-headed households. We're targeting um, child-headed households. Uh, we are targeting of uh, the elderly, uh, the households uh, with a member with a disability and the chronically ill and on palliative uh, care. And I must indicate that uh, uh, we, we are making steps to include uh, more categories uh, because uh, we have realized that uh, there could be possibly uh, other categories that may be vulnerable and uh, not covered uh, within the five categories that uh, we are working with uh, right now. Please go down. Yes, so in terms of the drivers of uh, growth uh, for the expansion, um, uh, this uh, expansion has been necessitated uh, because of uh, uh, the evidence that has been uh, built around uh, the social cash transfer programming. There are so many studies, assessments that have been uh, conducted uh, so far and outside uh, uh, the 2014 uh, social cash transfer impact uh, evaluation. Um, and actually, we, we, we are uh, uh, in the course of uh, having another impact evaluation. And uh, uh, from this evaluation, uh, we're able to see that uh, 
there, there are a lot of uh, uh, benefits accruing uh, to beneficiaries as, as a result of uh, this uh, intervention. And uh, 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 one of the recommendations uh, was that uh, we uh, increase the transfer value. We also expand in terms of uh, um, uh, the numbers of uh, people that get to benefit uh, from this uh, program. And then um, we, we have the uh, national uh, social protection policy, um, which identified the social assistance as one of um, yeah, key uh, 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 key areas um, in, in in terms of um, um, uh, basically we're looking at uh, social uh, cash transfer programming. Yeah, and uh, uh, it guided on how we should uh, move uh, forward in in terms of uh, progression, in terms of our numbers, and uh, we. Because of that, we have seen a rapid uh, scale up of uh, social cash transfer in, in Zambia. And uh, because of the same, we've also seen enhanced uh, uh, wider uh, coordination where the cooperating partners and other uh, development partners are coming uh, just to support uh, the work that we are doing. And then we are also guided uh, by the national development plans, uh, uh, talking about the seventh, eighth uh, national development uh, plans. Uh, which um, uh, gives uh, guidance on on how you know uh, social protection programs uh, uh, should be uh, executed, and then uh, the, the buy-in uh, from government also has has been very very helpful uh, in our expansion and and growth. Yes, so this slide uh, uh, focuses on the role of our cooperating partners. Uh, we have received a lot of our uh, support, uh, like I indicated earlier. We are where we are right now uh, because of uh, the support that uh, we continue to get uh, from our cooperating partners. We're talking about uh, our financial support. Um, uh, right now, uh, we, we have running with a total budget of uh, over 160 million uh, uh, US uh, dollars, that's the annual budget. So we have uh, funding coming uh, both uh, from corporate partners and also uh, government, and then uh, uh, technical support. Uh, and the technical support, uh, we, we have uh, uh, systems that are being built, like uh, the Zambia Integrated Social Protection Information System, the grievance mechanism, you know, the uh, financial management uh, systems, and uh, other areas of our programming. So we've also been assisted uh, in, in the aspect of our evidence uh, building. Uh, we, we, we've um, had an opportunity uh, to uh, engage consultants uh, through uh, cooperating partners on, on a number of uh, areas. Uh, and uh, also capacity development, and uh, we've also uh, been helped with uh, 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 issues of um, uh, procurement of assets and, and so on and so forth. Let's go down. Can you please try to wrap up soon, Mr. Shiwele, please? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, so we, we've also seen a failure taking assistance from our cooperating partners. Um, like I, I indicated, we have uh, the Microsoft uh, uh, Dynamics 365, uh, which is an accounting package that uh, we, we're rolling out. And then uh, uh, we've also been uh, assisted in the rollout of uh, uh, this piece, uh, which is a, a payment uh, system, which allows us uh, to, to track the payments, uh, just uh, in order for us uh, to give a comfort uh, to, to the partners who are supporting us. And uh, uh, we have been assisted in beneficial identification selection, the grievance mechanism that I talked about. And uh, we have uh, enhanced program communication with uh, communication strategy, that uh, we are using to communicate uh, uh, what we are doing. And uh, we have also a comprehensive M&D framework uh, 
that uh, we've uh, put in place with, with support uh, from the co corporate uh, cooperating partners. And then uh, the, the program management also has been uh, uh, strengthened and, and also the procurement uh, management. I should be concluding. Um, okay, but this is uh, where we are in terms of uh, status. Uh, you can go down. So the, for the future plans, uh, we, we have a plan uh, to increase uh, the coverage. Uh, and uh, next year, we're looking at uh, uh, scaling up uh, to a case load of about 1.3 million. And uh, also, we, we are looking at uh, increasing the transfer value. And also, we are looking at um, uh making uh a social cash transfer more adaptive uh there, there's a program that is coming on board which is a uh, scaling up a uh, shop responsive uh, social protection that will build on a uh, social cash transfer and uh it, it's aimed at stabilizing the flow of our uh, cash transfers and also we're trying to build a buffer stock uh, for emergencies and uh, we're also trying to invest in other cash plus interventions and uh we also seeing that uh, graduation has been a challenge and we're trying to actualize uh, the aspect of our graduation uh, pathways. I think this is where I end my presentation. Thank you so much for the time and thanks for the thank you. Thank you so much uh, indeed, Mr. Shiwede for your, for your intervention. You, you clearly uh, described how the government sees this program is in its comment for uh, human and livelihood uh, development actually in fact it is it appears to be a central element of the country's national development plan and you were referring to the significant budget that are being uh, invested there and the coverage of the program has uh, grown indeed uh, gradually and, it, and steadily over time and there is a further plan to to expand it uh, as you mentioned uh, also referring to the to the cash transfer and the cash plus uh, program uh, that will benefit all extremely poor and vulnerable households in the country. So thank you very much uh, for that, Mr. Shiwele. Thank you for joining us today. And I would like to welcome our two discussants today. Uh, we'll offer their uh, perspective on this topic and on what has been discussed so far. Uh, we have respectively Mr. Stephen Devereux, Research Fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, and Ms. Christina uh, Berendt, Head of Social Policy uh, unit in ILO. Uh, Mr. Devereux, I understand you will first give uh, your reflection on the discussion and more specifically of the expansion of coverage in rural areas. Uh, Mr. Devereux, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure if I was first in the program, but I don't mind if the PowerPoint is ready to be flighted. Yes, please go ahead. Can somebody upload the PowerPoint, please? Okay. Good. Um, firstly, I'd like to Good afternoon to everybody and thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to contribute to this very interesting and important dialogue. I want to use the next few minutes to make some high level comments on the topic of this meeting. If we compare social protection coverage in rural Africa 25 years ago with now, then clearly much has changed for the better in the last quarter century. Most fundamentally, Millions of Africans who had no access to any form of social protection in the late 1990s are now covered to varying extents. I want to look briefly at two success stories, Ethiopia and South Africa, that tell very different trajectories. In Ethiopia, the introduction of the Productive Safety Net Program in 2005 immediately delivered benefits to 4 million Ethiopians. And this has steadily increased over the years to about 10 or 11 uh, million Ethiopians today. Expansion has also been horizontal across livelihood systems in the sense that the PSNP started as a program to protect farmers in the highlands, but has subsequently extended to cover pastoralists and agro-pastoralists in the lowlands, despite the additional challenges of reaching those groups. 
The PSNP is now in its fifth cycle and has established itself as one of the biggest social assistance programs in Africa. And it will probably continue delivering benefits indefinitely. In 2016, the urban PSNP was launched. So there was an extension from the rural to urban areas, but on a much smaller scale than the rural PSNP, where the risk and severity of food insecurity are still considered to be significantly higher. Turning now to South Africa, when the child support grant was introduced in 1998, it initially reached only a few thousand children, but it now reaches 12 million children in poor families, about two thirds of all children in South Africa. This program does not differentiate between urban and rural. It was always a national program from the outset. Coverage was and is based entirely on assessed need with no geographical targeting. Farm workers who are seasonally unemployed, for, ex for instance, can also benefit from the child support grant. Despite these successes and many others throughout Africa, substantial challenges remain in achieving comprehensive coverage of social protection in rural areas. Next slide, please. At the continental level, the number of countries that actually have national scale social protection programs is still rather small and heavily concentrated in Eastern and Southern Africa. In Central and West Africa, many countries have few functioning social protection programs, and those that are in place are weakly institutionalized. So the first challenge is to support and promote the introduction of social protection programs in these late adopter countries, and or to support and promote the scaling up of small projects to become national programs that achieve significant coverage of poor, food insecure, and vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. The second challenge is within countries to extend coverage to those who are currently not reached by existing programs, even those that appear to be national in scale. We just heard a very positive story from Steve about the scale up in Zambia, but there are other cases that are not so uh, successful. And some of these I call pseudo universal social protection systems. Let's take two examples. Firstly, Rwanda. In Rwanda, the Vision 2020 Umurengi program, or VUP, which has a very similar design to the PSNP in Ethiopia, scaled up by starting in the poorest wards in the poorest districts until all rural districts had some coverage. But very often it was one ward per district. It wasn't that there was blanket coverage of the district. So simply saying that the VUP was operational in every rural district of the country does not mean that all vulnerable or eligible households in each district were reached. Because of budget constraints and administrative capacity constraints, many wards within districts were not reached at all. The government of Rwanda also had a preoccupation with graduation. So many communities were provided with support for only two to three years before it was announced that they had graduated and the program shifted to neighboring communities. This approach, which sees social protection as time bound and fixated on graduating people out of so-called dependence on social assistance, does not constitute regular predictable transfers to those who need it when they need it, and cannot therefore be qualified as adequate coverage. Next slide. In Malawi, social protection was introduced in one or two districts through a pilot social cash transfer project, which development partners evaluated as successful and tried to persuade the government to take over in terms of its management and financing and to scale it up to a national program. But the government was reluctant to do so. Instead, development partners replicated the pilot project model in other districts. The situation today, as I understand it, is that there are social assistance projects in every rural district of Malawi, but they are run and financed by several international agencies, while the government itself has taken responsibility for only one district out of 27. This, of course, is highly fragmented and unsustainable. Next slide, please. A third challenge was presented by COVID-19, which had the benefit of drawing attention to a huge gap in coverage of social protection systems, not only in Africa, but across the world, namely informal workers. Many governments are now rushing to fill that gap. For example, in South Africa, a temporary social relief of distress grant was introduced in 2020 to protect workers who were forced to sit at home unemployed during COVID-19 lockdowns. That program is now in the process of being converted to a permanent basic income support grant for low income 18 to 59 year olds. This is an important positive development. 
On the other hand, since informal workers are concentrated mainly in urban areas, this might shift focus away from rural beneficiaries and risks diverting policy attention and financing towards urban areas to the relative neglect of rural areas and needs. Next slide, please. To conclude, the surge in social protection since the late 1990s has clearly benefited millions of rural Africans and is a significant achievement by governments and their development partners. However, there is still a long way to go to achieve the, the SDG goal of substantial coverage by 2030. So here I identify three complementary priorities. The first is to move as quickly as possible towards universal coverage of social protection for rural and urban populations throughout Africa. But here I want to note that universal coverage does not mean that all people in rural or urban areas would get free cash transfers from the government every month. It means that all people would have guaranteed access to income support from the government if and when they need it. The second priority is to institutionalize the management and delivery of social protection within African governments by strengthening beneficiary management systems and by underpinning policies and programs with framework legislation that upgrades social protection to a right that can be claimed by citizens and residents. The third priority is to accelerate the convergences that were highlighted by COVID-19, for instance, by harmonizing social protection program, programming and humanitarian programming through shock responsive modalities, by delivering cash rather than in-kind transfers wherever possible, and by using digital rather than manual payments mechanisms again, wherever possible. Last slide, please. Once these three transitions are achieved, the goal of universal coverage of rural as well as urban populations in Africa will be relatively easy to reach. Maybe not by 2030, but hopefully very soon thereafter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Devereux, for, for giving us a nuanced uh, perspective indeed. I mean, uh, huge progress made since uh, over the last 20 years, 25 years, as you mentioned. Uh, very good uh, early adopters, as you mentioned, referring to Ethiopia, PSNP, and South Africa, uh, but still gaps, gaps at, uh, I would say, continental level, especially when it comes to uh, Central and West Africa, as well as uh, need to be uh, nuanced uh, at uh, at country level, where where we may it may look as if there is coverage, but actually there are still many people uh, left behind that. And then the lessons from the from the COVID nineteen, uh, uh, of course, very important. And then for the the recommendations you have made, including in terms of uh, uh, institutionalized social protection within government, which I find. It's very important. So thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Devereux, for your for your uh, remarks. And I will now move to uh, Miss Berens, uh, will give us a reflection on the on the especially when it comes to the expansion of uh, of coverage for for informal uh, workers. So the floor is yours, uh, Christina. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique, and hello, hello everyone. And I would really like to thank the, the FAO for organizing this, this excellent event. And I'm trying to uh, start my presentation at the, uh, at the same time. Um, so I really tried to be very concise because I realized that I, I'm the one standing before <laughs> between you and, and the, the time that we have for the discussion. So I'll try, try to be very brief and just kind of highlight um, some of the key points that have been have been have come out in this uh, extremely rich uh, session, which I think I think it's really excellent um, because it really has brought out, um, as, as Stephen said, kind of a lot of the the progress that has happened over the last uh, the last um, one two decades, um, but also very much uh, the challenges that we still face when it comes uh, to covering uh, rural populations and, and also um, agricultural workers. Let me just start with one key point, and I think this is also um, continuing where, um, where, where Stephen ended. Um, I think when we talk about um, national social protection systems and ways of achieving uh, universal social protection, we have to talk about a combination of different, of different mechanisms. So we have to talk um, about strengthening, um, well, ideally tax finance, non-contributory mechanisms, 
Um, but we also need to talk about the contributory side and, the, uh, and especially um, social insurance mechanisms. And as, as I was asked to focus particularly on workers, I will now um, focus um, the rest of my presentation mainly um, on the contributory side, but without forgetting the other side, which I think um, is extremely important. And especially when we talk when we talk about agricultural workers um, who are one of the kind of the most vulnerable categories of workers. And, and I think this is really, really important that we look at this combination um, of different benefits and also combination of financing mechanisms. And when we think about um, a, a rights-based approach uh, to achieve universal social protection, I think it, this is really about building uh, those universal social protection systems with a very strong um, social protection for. And uh, this is about also strengthening the national policy and legal frameworks and the institutional capacities, including the financing capacities. And I think Stephen's um, example of, on, on Malawi has kind of highlighted that, that, uh, that very much. Um, I think what is also important, and that came out um, of, um, of several other presentations and several speakers have highlighted the importance to coordinate social protection policies with um, employment policies, but also with agricultural and other policies. Um, I mean, also, we have heard that, for example, on, on Lebanon, when um, talking about the, uh, the farmers registries and really kind of highlighting and, and facilitating um, access and facilitating also the pathways to really make sure um, that everyone is covered, um, workers in, in, all, in all types of employment. And I think one part of that story also is um, that when extending social protection coverage, ex especially to those who are currently in the informal economy, um, I think it's important to follow a transformative approach, which does not just provide um, social protection benefits, but also tries to address the decent work deficits that these, uh, these workers face, and also um, progressively also facilitate their transition from the informal to the formal economy. And this obviously is very much part um, also of a just transition um, towards kind of environmentally sustainable economies and societies and for achieving progress towards the SDGs. I'm going to jump a bit over um, some of the slides, but I just want to highlight um, work that we have been doing together with FAO um, on really coming up with joint policy perspectives on how that can be achieved, how social protection can be extended um, to rural populations in order to really to overcome these um, very specific barriers also that um, workers in the agricultural sector, but also in, in rural areas um, are facing and really come try to come up with some very kind of practical advice. And I think we have seen in the examples that we have um, heard before. I think we have seen uh, a lot of those um, those points already put into into practice, and I think this is really something we can we can all uh, learn from. And I'll have to because I, I think because of of the time, I'm going to um, to skip most of of that that point. But I think um, what is really important and thinking about the very practical ways. Is, is really to extend coverage um, to agricultural world workers. And we know that they are still very kind of largely excluded from national lead, legal and also policy frameworks. And sometimes quite often when they are included, um, the regulations are not implemented. So uh, this is really to make sure that they are included and they're uh, also included in, in practice and not just, not just on paper. And I think what is important there also is, is prioritizing inclusive approaches um, that really um, include agricultural workers in general social insurance system. Also considering that quite often um, they are not necessarily in the agricultural sector for all, all the year, or sometimes they combine um, work outside the sector um, during the year or even, even sometimes working part-time. So I think this is really important to, to avoid fragmentation. 
And I think there is our important ways also to include seasonal workers. And I think another category that we really need to think about is including migrant workers, which really constitute quite a lot, uh, kind of a large share um, of agricultural workers. So I'm not going to go through all the, all the details, but I think I would really invite, invite you to take a look um, at, those, uh, at those materials. And because I think that is really helpful to, um, to um, develop and put these, um, these mechanisms into practice. Um, and following on on what, uh, what Natalia has said also at the beginning, I think what's important also um, is to really combine um, the adequate social protection coverage for workers and including workers in all types of employment uh, with other life cycle programs, um, such as, as Natalia has mentioned, universal child benefits. We also know that uh, pensions play an, an important role. And I think that this is also plays really also a key role, especially when um, um, with a view also to eliminating child and forced labor, which is a very important um, part also of the realities uh, in the agricultural sector and rural areas in many countries. So let me just finish with one, um, one final slide really on the kind of com coming back to the topic um, of that session on, on pathways towards universal social protection. And I think we are now at a very critical point. We've seen during COVID and we know also during now with all the other crises that have come to us, I think there has been a realization how much social protection needs to be part um, of economic um, and social policies. I think, and many countries have actually invested um, into, into their social protection systems to strengthen it. Um, so which really trying to follow a kind of a high road uh, approach to social, to social protection. But at the same time, we also know that many countries are, are facing debt crisis, they're facing high fiscal deficits, and this might um, prevent them actually from making the necessary investment and strengthening their, their social protection systems. And I think at that point, uh, it's really important to in a, in a way to harness the political commitment that is there um, at, at different levels and really step up efforts to jointly um, accelerate progress uh, in, that, in that regard, um, including through also the Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions. And as Natalia has mentioned, there is an, an event, um, a side event at the General Assembly just this, this Friday. And I think I'll, I'll end here with this, with this call for really um, these joint efforts um, for universal social protection. And I'll hand back to you, Dominique. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christina, for your, for your presentation, for making a few very important points, of course, on the, the criticality of uh, extending the coverage of social protection to rural workers, taking into consideration the specific the specificities of the sector, including in terms of informality, for example, but also the importance of combining different instruments for different groups, in some case, social assistance, in other case, social insurance. Uh, and also, thank you for referring to the FAOILO approach, pro which provides some solutions for reaching uh, these uh, population groups and to the, the, the event that will take place uh, this week in New York that were referred to by uh, by several participants, and that we that show that we need really to think in terms of a, of a movement uh, moving forward uh, on this. So thank you very much, and uh, and this shows that this is a very very uh, broad uh, topic, and that uh, we need to uh, to to deepen our analysis and and continue coming forward on that. So unfortunately, I see that we have. Uh, that we have reached uh, the end of the of the two hours, so I don't think we'll be able to to engage really this time in a in an exchange. But I hope it will come uh, next time. And um, and dear colleagues, uh, excellencies, uh, it's clear today that we have listened to many uh, contributions that have tied together many threads of our discussion uh, today and given us a lot to think about. Uh, we will extract some of the key take-home messages. 
and preliminary conclusions from these discussions and propose them to you at the beginning of our next webinar. So we will have several webinars each time. We'll start by what came out uh, from the previous one. Uh, my own preliminary conclusion are that agri-food systems offer an enormous potential for achieving the, the SDGs. However, this is not automatic. And to realize this potential, agri-food system need to be inclusive and social protection can play a role in making agri-food system uh, more inclusive and achieve that. Still today, access to social protection is too low uh, and extending the coverage has been a really a, a recurrent uh, theme. There has been uh, enormous progress that has been made, as was mentioned, uh, to expand social protection. But there is still a lot to be done for ensuring that everyone everywhere, starting from the poor and most vulnerable, indeed have access to uh, such uh, social protection. And that to be adequate, social protection systems need to be responsive to the specificities of the population that they serve. And this was another uh, key point that came out uh, forcefully today. We have learned how Lebanon and Zambia are going uh, about expanding coverage and our partners can support them in realizing their, their ambition um, their ambition and in terms of expanding uh, coverage. Uh, we have also learned from the effort undertaken by Morocco to generalize social protection in the country and the, the progress made, including in terms of sharing uh, the experience. I think this has all been very informative and I'm sure there are plenty of other examples that would benefit this community and I would like to invite you to, to make sure that we are made aware of these examples and that we can share them as part of, of this series. Um, but before ending, of course, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the distinguished speakers who dedicated their valuable time to be with us today. I would like to thank also our partners in this series, of course, uh, critical partners, ILO and, and UNICEF, as well as, of course, our colleagues uh, in the FAO Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division, and my colleagues within the, the Geneva office uh, for organizing that. Last but not least, uh, our gratitude goes to you, the participants, for taking your time and for joining uh, this uh, event as part of the um, FAO in Geneva Social Protection uh, Dialogue Series. Uh, thank you for your attendance. There will be more events in this series. So please reach out, make sure that uh, all those involved in that at all levels are participating and, uh, and uh, do join us at our next uh, webinar. Uh, which will explore the role of social protection in responding to shocks, adapting to climate change, and much, much more. So thank you for that, and I uh, wish you a great rest of the day. Thank you, and bye-bye.